And not to be a semanticist, but the semantics of the word shortage and deficit are different. So I'm going to go through this briefly. First of all, for review for everybody in the room, this is last year's production. Platinum is about 12 times rarer than gold, and silver is about eight times more plentiful than gold. So none of those ratios hold for what they're priced at. Platinum is actually selling for less than gold, even though it's about 11 or 12 times more scarce. And silver is about, right now, about 50th the price of gold, even though the ratio out of the earth is about 8 to 1. But that's how they line up. And that's pretty much historically how they line up. There's some variances over time, but I'm going to go into that right now. <clears throat> but a shortage doesn't equal a deficit. There have actually been shortages the way I define it. And a shortage to me is when you cannot meet the demand on the market or at the spot or when it's demanded. And there was a shortage in retail products in the bottom in 2008 during the financial crisis. Maybe some of the silver bearers thought that a lot of people would cough up their silver at those low prices, but the opposite happened. People that were in the know wanted to buy silver at those extremely low prices. Although the spot price in the futures market was roughly $9, slightly under that at the bottom, the actual price to buy what I call retail product, which was government-minted coins, one ounce silver rounds, which are privately minted coins, 100 ounce bars, 10 ounce bars, even one ounce bars, anything along those lines commanded a premium of about 20 to 30 percent. So you're paying about 1350 for silver when the paper price on the futures exchange was nine. Now, just to be perfectly clear, a commercial bar on a futures exchange could be purchased for nine dollars or less. I happen to do it, I bought three of them myself. In fact, I uh, took those and took, uh, sent them to a, a mint friend of mine that happens to be in this room, and I'm inviting him over to my booth after this lecture and minted them into uh, half-ounce silver rounds. So we have seen some shortages. Uh, also, when uh, Eric Sprott started the PSLV, the Physical Silver Trust, he purchased around 22 million ounces on the first tranche. And it took roughly two months to fulfill that order. Is that a shortage or not? You can make up your own mind on that. Will we see a shortage in the future? Yes, I believe it will happen. It'll happen, I think, and once it happens, it could develop into something very significant because industry needs silver, as that little film clip showed you. Uh, that demand is very um, price inelastic. When you build a $5,000 refrigerator and the total content of silver is about 12 bucks, if the price of silver goes up tenfold and you have to pay 120 bucks for it for a $5,000 refrigerator, it's called price inelastic. They don't give a darn what the price of silver is, but you cannot manufacture that product without it. If that ever happens, and I'm forecasting that it would or could, I think it will, then you're going to see a rush from everybody that really doesn't warehouse much silver to get this just-in-time inventory because they'll have to close down their production line without it. The supply-demand curve looks like that. Remember, a shortage and a deficit are different things. The demand curve from 1990, I know this chart starts at 1992. In 1990, until about 2006, there was greater demand than there was supply for silver. And that deficit between those two lines was made up by above-ground stockpiles. That little film pointed out, between 1990 and 2006, roughly 1.5 billion ounces of silver went into the marketplace to fill that gap. After 2006, we've actually been technically in a surplus. I tend to, to believe that's probably fairly accurate. And I get a little blowback on that because a lot of people that followed my work early on were concerned that if silver isn't in a deficit anymore, then what's the use of buying it? because now, you know, it looks like we're at the margin and there's a little bit more out there that's available than, uh, you know, it's more supply than demand currently. And I say, you know, if that's the way you think, that's fine. But apply that same logic to the gold market. So if we look at it in raw numbers, everyone can understand. What I'm saying is you've got a, roughly a six-month supply of silver above ground, but in the same context, you have a 40-year supply of gold above ground. Gold is a monetary metal, and that's the reason you can have a 40-year supply above ground and continue to see the increase in price, and I think everyone in this room knows all the arguments about that, and it just boils down to the financial situation globally. Silver has every attribute of money that gold has, 
And because of that, and it's, less, it's more affordable, I think you're going to see more and more demand on the silver side than the gold side going forward, only because there's a lot more poor people that want to protect their wealth. Those are our people that are able to afford gold, gold once it gets above 2,000 or so. Pick a number. But the idea, I think, is very clear. Photography is killing the silver market. It's true that uh, digital photography took the silver market uh, substantially down. The amount of silver halide processing now is roughly uh, significantly less than it was in 1999. Digital has come to the fore. Almost everybody here has a phone that has a camera on it. It's all digital. It's great. Remember when that myth was started? Silver was at about $4.80 an ounce. It's been as high as 48. It's about a 10 bagger. So how did that myth work out for you? you know? Anyone that didn't buy silver because of the photography lie didn't understand what was going on. I had to go through great detail about the photography myth in my book. I'm not going to lecture for an hour on the myth, but the basics of it is all that silver was recycled. People had the idea that photography used silver up like it does in most other applications. In photography, it was all recycled. So it's a zero-sum game. If you used a million ounces in silver halide film, you got a million ounces out or 100 million ounces out the next year, and on and on it went. So it was a zero-sum game, but most people didn't understand that. Again, I went through it in my book in rather good detail. This is a chart that shows pretty significantly what happened. Uh, you can see the photography, silver halide processing, down significantly. I never argued that point. I said, yes, it would, but it didn't mean anything. Again, the price went up tenfold while this photography myth was pervasive throughout. A lot of people didn't really understand the silver market. On the other hand, the electronic side has come up, and of course, that helped the market, and that's why we've got higher prices along with investment demand. At high prices, silver will be recycled. Now, I want to be very clear here because over and over again, especially in the silver community, you hear that there's less silver available than gold or something that's a little bit vague like that. And I want to be very specific here. The amount of above ground silver that's in investment form is less than gold in investment form. The amount of above ground, ground silver that exists in all forms is probably 20 billion ounces, okay? So let's be crystal clear on that. However, the amount in investment form, which is either commercial bar form, which is your 1,000-ounce commercial bars, and your coin form, which is silver rounds, government-minted uh, coins like the Silver Eagle or the Silver Maple or any of those, and even old coins like...